Okay, it's 2 p.m. now. So, um, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Eunice and I'll be chairing today's webinar. Welcome to our Applying for the Overseas Training Program um, webinar series. The country that we're covering today is the United Kingdom. So, this webinar is brought to you by Cardiff Healthcare International Perspectives, Chips and Shot, in collaboration with NMI UK. I'll just give a brief introduction of CHIPS. CHIPS is a community of healthcare students based in Cardiff University who is keen to educate and support our future leaders. We organize regular teaching sessions, clinical OSCE sessions, and also quiz sessions. So um, I'll pass it on to Tai Ling, which is the president of MMI UK, to give a brief introduction about MMI UK. So with you, Tai Ling. Hi everyone, I'm Tai Ling. I'm from MMI UK. Um, I'm the president of MMI UK and um, we're really privileged to ha um, be able to collaborate with um, CHIPS for this webinar. Um, thank you to Dr. Suso for your time today and um, I'll just give a brief introduction about MMI UK as well. So MMI UK is basically a group of Malaysian medics, um, both medical students and doctors. Um, we have um, different events. Uh, like specialty talk events um, and um, tutorials and stuff like that. And basically we're here to connect, educate and cultivate Malaysian medics. Um, so be sure to check out our um, Facebook page. Um, it's MMI United Kingdom um, and also our Instagram. Um, yeah. So thank you again um, to Chips for giving us this chance to collaborate with you for this very successful event. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Tai Ling, and thank you, MMI UK. So um, today we have four very wonderful speakers here with us. Um, our first speaker for the day will be um, Dr. Yi Chuan Tan, YC. And our second and third speaker will be Dr. Nicholas Tan and Dr. Kimberly Tan. But unfortunately, they can't make it um, today because they are quite preoccupied with their clinical work. But then they've already recorded their presentation and they have sent it over to us, which I'll play it later during the second presentation. And our fourth speaker for today will be um, Dr. Zihao Liao, um, who will be covering, and all the speakers today will be covering a range of topics. Dr. Yi Chen Tan will be covering the application process. Dr. Nicholas and Dr. Kimberly Tan will be speaking about how to be a competitive IMG, and Dr. Zihao Liao will cover the UK training program details. So, um, just a few housekeeping rules before we start. Firstly, this webinar will be recorded. Second, at any point, if you do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat box below. We'll try our best to answer all the questions if we do have enough time. And um, lastly, please remain muted at all times and do not share your video. So let's move on to our first speaker, um, Dr. Yi Chen Tan. So Dr. Tan is currently a junior clinical fellow at Charing Cross Hospital, Imperial Healthcare NHS Trust and he's keen on pursuing a career in trauma and orthopedics. So Dr. Tan graduated from the International Medical University, IMU Malaysia in 2017 and completed his PLAB1 and 2 exams in 2018 prior to securing a foundation program training in London. So um, over to you, I see. Tan and Dr. Sorry. So, um, Dr. Nicholas Tan and Dr. Kimberly Tan completed their medical degree at the University of Santo Thomas, Philippines in 2013. Both of them are the founder of the Savvy IMG website, which is an online resource for international medical graduates who wish to pursue a career in the UK. The link to their website can be found at the bottom of their presentation slides later. As they unfortunately can't make it to the webinar today, they have pre-recorded their presentation and I'm going to start playing it now. So if you do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat box below. Hi everybody, welcome to our talk today on how to be a competitive international medical graduate in the UK. My name is Nicholas Tan, I'm an ING from the Philippines and I'm currently working as a locum doctor in London. And I'm Kimberly Tan, also an IMG from the Philippines, currently working as an ophthalmology registrar at King's College Hospital in London. And together we created the Savvy IMG, an online resource to help IMGs such as yourself learn how to come to the UK and maximize your career options here. Now, before we start, we just want to say a huge thank you to the people over at the CHIPS community 
for inviting us to give this talk and we hope that you will find it really helpful on your own journey to the UK. So, what are we going to cover? Firstly, we will give you a brief introduction about us and, an, and our own journey to the UK. Then I'm going to share my personal experience of successfully applying for a competitive specialty in the UK as an IMG. Then majority of today's talk is going to be about what the competitive specialties or training hospitals are actually looking for and what you as a medical student can do to be competitive. So I hope that all sounds good and we're going to get started with a little bit about us. So we both moved to the Philippines at age 13. Before that I lived in Taiwan and Kim lived in the UK. We then met at med school, graduated around mid 2013 uh, from University of Santa Tomas in Philippines and went through the whole pathway to GMC registration through IELTS and PLAB. We then started our UK careers in the UK Foundation program, which is basically the UK two-year internship program here. And afterwards, Kim and I went down different routes. Yeah. So I've been on a non-training pathway since doing locum work, while Kim directly applied for ophthalmology training straight from the Foundation program. And she's going to share a little bit about her experience and how she got into this competitive specialty in London on her first try as an IMG. Yeah, so thanks Nick. I applied for ophthalmology residency as an IMG during the second year of the foundation program known as FY2. And although I did succeed in the end, it certainly wasn't easy. I was discouraged by a lot of my colleagues for a few reasons and I had to deal with their doubts and my own self-doubts. And some of those reasons are, number one, my target specialty, ophthalmology, is well known to be very competitive. And number two, I wanted to get into London because this is where my family is based. And again, London is known to be highly competitive. And three, they believe that I was disadvantaged as an IMG. And to be very honest, it did get me down for a while, but I was determined to achieve my goal. So I made the decision to look past all the negativity and absorb only the constructive advice and focus on formulating my strategy for success. So I networked with doctors in ophthalmology. I reached out to consultants, trainees. I took on project after project to build up my portfolio. I saved money. I sacrificed social activities and my free time so I could study for exams, attend courses, present projects at international conferences. And in the end, did it pay off? Well, I'm really glad to say, yes, it did. I was successful on my very first application to ophthalmology directly from FY2. Now, many of the ophthalmology trainees that I met had applied two to three times before getting in. So I'm quite proud to have succeeded on my first application. And I didn't just get in, I actually did really well. I managed to rank 96 percentile nationwide in ophthalmology during a year when the competition ratio was 4.84. So that means for every place in the training program, there are about four to five applicants. And that year there are about 430 applicants and only 80 jobs available. And not only that, I was able to get a training spot in my first choice scenery, which is London, and specifically South London. And that year there were only five places for ophthalmology in South London and I managed to secure my place because I had a high rank in the applications. So now I'm an ophthalmology trainee and this is my dream specialty and I'm really enjoying it. And I believe any IMG can achieve their dreams too with hard work and the right strategy. So I want to share with you some insights today about how you can do this yourself. Now this talk is only 20 minutes long and it's impossible to get into the true details that will allow you to replicate my strategy, but I want to give you some important lessons and concrete steps that will allow you to take some action today. So let's talk about what competitive specialties are actually looking for. Well, the first things first, you have to understand that when you apply for training in the UK, you don't submit multiple applications to different specialties. You actually submit one application per specialty. Now the whole application process is standardized nationwide. So all doctors throughout the UK applying for a particular specialty submit their application through an online portal. And you can't choose directly where you want to work. Instead, you choose from a list of regions or a list of 
hospitals and rotations and you rank them according to your preference. So your most preferred places on top, your least preferred at the bottom, and those places that you don't want to be considered for, you remove from the list. Then what happens next is a matching process. So your application is scored, and the higher your application score, the higher your chances of getting into the hospital or area that you prefer. Okay, so just to make it clear, you make one application to each specialty you want to apply for, you select the places you want to be considered for, and then you will get your place depending on how well you do in your application. So the question is, what are the competitive specialties looking for? So training hospitals don't choose their trainees. They get allocated their trainees according to their scores. So it's the specialties that create their selection criteria. Now, before I go into that, what the selection criteria is, etc., First, I just want to review some of the myths and replace them with facts about applying for UK specialty training. And most of these myths are based on the assumption that the application process in other countries is the same as in the UK. But that's not usually the case, and we'll discuss that now. So let's start with the first one, PLAB scores. I know in some countries there's an entrance exam or licensing exam, and your score on that will affect your application. But in the UK, the PLAB scores do not affect your application whatsoever. So whether you barely pass or you pass with flying colors, it won't help your application, nor will it be detrimental. So that's good. What actually matters when you apply to specialty training is the score of your application. And there are two or three components of the application score. Number one is your portfolio. This is your CV, all your achievements publications, teaching, presentations, leadership skills, etc. The second is your interview performance. And the third, which is only applicable to some specialties, is called the Multi-Specialty Recruitment Assessment, or MSRA. So the MSRA is somewhat of an entrance exam for specific specialties only. The higher you score in the test, the better. Specialties that use this entrance exam include general practice, ophthalmology, radiology, neurosurgery, psychiatry, and a few others. So again, to summarize, PLAB scores don't matter. What matters is your application score, which is made up of your portfolio, your interview, and plus minus the MSRA. Now, myth number two. A lot of people think that electives, letters of recommendation, and personal statements are important for residency applications in the UK. Now, I know that these are very important when applying in the US, but in the UK, these things actually play a very small role. So, for example, electives, they can get you one to two points out of, let's say, 60 or 70 points in your portfolio score. So it's very, very small in terms of how much it actually matters in your overall application. Letters of recommendation don't get you any points anywhere in the portfolio interview. So it's not necessary to get a really good letter of recommendation from a prominent person in your specialty. And personal statements, they're also not a component of the application score in any specialty except cardiothoracic surgery. So what actually matters is having broad evidence of commitment to specialty. So let's just break down that, those terms for a second. What is commitment to specialty? So this is being able to show that you are interested in a specialty, not because you said so, but through your actions. Okay, so it's not based on a personal statement that you write and you say, you know, when I was five, I broke my arm and now I want to be an orthopedic surgeon. That's not going to get you into training in the UK. What really matters is having this evidence of your commitment to specialty. So what does this involve? So it means having multiple achievements or activities in your portfolio that demonstrate your interest in a particular specialty. This can include an elective, having a publication in that specialty, attending conferences for that specialty, passing exams specific to that specialty, having a logbook of patients or procedures for that specialty. So all of these things are different ways to show that you are committed to that specialty, not just an elective, not just a story, but all of it, all together. Now the last myth is that being an IMG means you are less likely to get into training in the UK. And that's what my colleagues thought when I was applying. 
Now, I admit, it used to be the case that UK graduates and citizens were prioritised over IMGs, but that changed in October 2019. The immigration rules have now changed in your favour as an IMG. So IMGs and UK graduates are now considered equally for UK training spots. So it all boils down to your application score. If you have a higher application score than a UK graduate, then you can get the job over them. So at the moment, there's no reason why you can't get into even the most competitive specialties as long as you have a good application score. Of course, immigration rules can always change, but if you want to make the most of it, you have to grab this opportunity now. Right, so those were the myths and facts. Now let's look at what competitive specialties are looking for. What is the most important component of your application? Is it a strong background in research? Is it having lots of publications, lots of voluntary work, multiple electives, a PhD? Actually, it's not just one thing. What they are looking for is a well-rounded applicant. So having a very strong background in just one area is not going to help you get into a competitive specialty. You need to have achievements in all areas, so you need to be a well-rounded applicant. So what are these areas that you need to have achievements in? What makes you a well-rounded applicant? So here's a list of some of the common areas known as domains that most specialties will score you in. Things like quality improvement projects, presentations, publications, commitment to specialty, courses, conferences, exams, and of course, doing well in your interview. These are all the things that you can gain points in for your application. And you score higher by having as many achievements in as many domains as possible, rather than just scoring highly in one domain. So how much do you have to do in each domain to score well? How should you split your efforts between each of these domains? Well, it depends on the specialty. Each specialty will have a set of domains that they include in the application score. So you have to find out which domains are considered for your target specialty. And then each specialty will have a scoring system for each domain. Most specialties publish their scoring criteria online and they tell you exactly how many points you'll get depending on what you do for that domain. And then each specialty will have a different weight for each score in the domain. So some may give a higher weight to publications, some may give a higher weight to exams, and some may give a higher weight to commitment to specialty. So when you get your hands on that scoring system, you'll be able to determine how much effort you should put into each domain, depending on what's included. You'll be able to determine what you have to do in order to get a higher score and what the weight is for that domain. So I hope you found that informative. Over to you, Nick. Yes, I know. All of this can be quite overwhelming. But now you know all of that, what can you do as a medical student to be a competitive IMG? Now, this is a very short presentation and we only have a few minutes left to go over this, but I'll try my best to give you some concrete steps that you can take in order to become competitive. So first, get your hands on the scoring criteria for the specialty that you're interested in. If you're interested in more than one, get your hands on all of them. It doesn't matter what stage of your career you are in, the earlier you know this, the better. These are publicly available for most specialties and for your convenience, we have compiled all of these different links to each specialty on our website, so be sure to check that out. Second, score yourself with your current achievements against the scoring criteria. What would your score be if you were to apply right now? This will help you get used to their scoring system and master this quite early on. Next, after you've done the scoring, you may find that your current score is kind of on the lower end at the moment. But don't despair, you still have time. I want you to think of what you can improve in each domain and get a realistic target score for each domain. What score do you aim to reach by the time you're applying for UK residency? Will that be enough? Remember to take into account how competitive your target specialty is. Next, plan how you are going to achieve that score. Here you are going to need to take multiple things into consideration like things such as 
you know, determine whether the work you do as a medical student will count, or do you have to wait until you graduate before you can do them? How much time do you need for each project? And at what stage in your career will you plan to do them? What are the application windows and deadlines for each requirement? Connections. Who do you need to network with? Which consultant should you work with to get projects done? Can you do this back home in your home country? Or do you need to wait until you come to the UK before you start working on it? And of course, how much money do you need to put aside? You know, taking exams, attending or even presenting at conferences, all the different courses you need to attend to get more points, the whole GMC registration process, plane tickets, and many more. These can get quite expensive and you'll have to save for that. Now, it can be a big investment, so think about how much you are willing to spend and how far you are willing to go. So these are the questions only you can answer since you know your situation best. All right. And in Kim's case, uh, she started thinking about all these during FY1. Spent almost £4,000 on her applications for exams, courses, conferences, plane tickets, things like that. As she's mentioned previously, she also sacrificed a lot of free time working on her portfolio after work, in the evenings and weekends. So it's not easy. You will need to work hard. But with the right strategy, it will all pay off in the end. And lastly, formulate a backup plan. No matter how much you prepare for the future, things may always go sideways. So always, always, always have a backup plan so that you don't get stuck. All right. And the most important message here is the more competitive the specialty or location you want to work in, the earlier you should start preparing. So for example, if you want to get into a competitive specialty such as new surgery, or you want to work in a competitive location like London or any other big cities, you kind of need to prepare quite early on because there's a lot that you need to do to achieve a high application score. So that was our talk. We gave you a brief overview about us, Kim's experience getting into UK specialty training as an IMG, what the competitive specialties are looking for, and the steps you can take as a medical student to become competitive. If you're looking for more guidance about a career here in the UK, do check out our website, thesavvyimg.co.uk. Here you can find more information about coming here as an IMG, how to determine your career goals, the different pathways for each goal, and tips on how to get ahead, and many more. Now, maybe you haven't decided yet whether you want to come to the UK for training, but for those who have decided, we have the IMGs for UK ST1 or CT1 Masterclass. This is an online course where I teach you my winning strategy to get into UK specialty training step by step as an IMG. And it can be used for any specialty except GP and public health because these have very different application processes. Now the course consists of 86 on-demand videos that you can watch at any time on your laptop, tablet or smartphone. And these videos are updated every year and contain over 12 and a half hours of detailed instruction. There are resource lists, worksheets, checklists and more for all specialties, including internal medicine, pediatrics, surgery, ophthalmology, radiology, obstetrics, all of the specialties except, as I said, GP. Through the masterclass, you will also have access to our exclusive private Facebook group where I answer your questions in the weekly question and answer session. So if anything's unclear, you're always free to ask me. And if you enroll now, you can get £25 off the masterclass with our special CHIPS discount using the code CHIPS25. And you will have access all the way up until you get into training, which can be one to two years from now. So this is the perfect time for you to start preparing your application as a medical student, because if done right, what you achieve overseas as a medical student or intern will count towards your application score in the UK. Now, just one thing to keep in mind, this masterclass is designed for those who are really serious about pursuing specialty training in the UK, and they want to achieve success in the shortest time possible. If you're on the fence and you're still not sure, I would advise you not to take the masterclass. But if you're serious about this and you're ready to put in the hard work to reach your dream, then I would love to have you in the course and show you the winning strategy so you can succeed in getting into UK training like some of our students. 
So we have more information about the masterclass on the website, including testimonials from our students. And I invite you to visit the website and learn more about how the masterclass can help you. Okay. So thank you for listening to our talk today. We hope that you have found it helpful and it's given you a clear idea of what it takes to get into specialty training in the UK. And again, we invite you to visit the website and our email list where we give you more tips and advice for your UK journey. Thank you once again to the members of the CHIPS committee for inviting us to give this talk today. And we wish you all the best in your medical careers. Best of luck, everyone. Okay, so thank you very much to Dr. Nicholas Tan and Dr. Kimberly Tan. And do check out their website if you're interested to find out more. It's the savvyimg.co.uk. Okay. So we're going to move on to our last presentation for today. So, um, yeah, <laughs> Dr. Liu. I'll just give a brief introduction. So Dr. Leo is a foundation year two doctor working in obstetrics and gynecology in the James Paget Hospi uh, University Hospital. Dr. Leo had the highest performance throughout his undergraduate academic career as a medical student in Newcastle University Medicine, Malaysia. And he earned multiple distinguished awards. He graduated with a first class honors degree and he was a <laughs> for all the five years of his undergraduate study. Over to you, Neil. Oh, hi guys, hi, good afternoon. So today I'm just gonna speak to you a bit about training in the UK. Um, again, my name is Leo. I'm one of the um, foundation year two doctors currently working in James Paget. Uh, it's one of the hospitals in Norfolk in the east of England. So today I'll be speaking to you about uh, the UK Foundation Program, a little, about, a little bit about what's entailed, also a bit about specialty training program. I also discuss my personal experience working in the UK and a little bit about the work culture working in the UK and the healthcare system in the UK and <laughs> why you should consider coming to the UK. So the UK Foundation Program is a two-year program consisting of six placements in total um, there can be a mixture of placements such as obstetrics and gynecology, pediatrics, ENT sometimes, but at least there's going to be one medical placement and one surgical placement. Um, you might have community placements like GP and psychiatry as well. So the UK Foundation program serves as a bridge to get between med school as a medical student and into your special, specialty training. So it's, a, it's like an introduction into the workplace. So it's a good it's a good time to work yourself through to becoming a good doctor, to build your skills, um, your professional skills and your clinical skills. And it's a really good time to make mistakes because no one is going to blame you for making mistakes during the UK Foundation Programme as you're just starting on your career. So there are four types of Foundation Programme. Um, two of them are new. The Psychiatry Programme is new. The Foundation Priority Programme is very new. So I'm not very familiar with both of them. But I'm going to speak to you more about the program itself, which is the most commonly um, sought after. There, there is also the academic foundation program, um, which has a placement where you do work. But as a program I'm in, I'm in the UK foundation program itself. So it's very similar. So let me move on and talk to you about the portfolio to start off. Clinical uh, teaching events that you've done or learning events. Can you guys do hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, it says internet not stable. I'm sorry for that. So as I said, um, it's the uh, the ePortfolio is a is a place where you it's online. It's a place where you put in whatever whatever you learned throughout um, the first year of foundation and your second year of foundation. Um, you can log in your meeting with your supervisors. You can log log. Um, it's uh, a learning event that you do with your senior colleagues, and it serves as a as a diary what that you've done. And here, the panels will look through what you've done and deem if you're if you've met met all the um, all the criteria to pass through your first year or second year of your foundation program. 
So this is the checklist of things that you need to do in your first year or uh, in your first year of your foundation program. As I've mentioned, learning events such as case discussion and evaluations and direct observational procedures. These are things that you will be doing throughout your placements and you have to log it into your um, Horace portfolio. There are also core procedures that you need to, to do, such as ABGs, uh, categorizations, um, intramuscular injections, things like that you, need to, that you need to do in order to pass your first year of your foundation program. Placement reports with your clinical supervisors and, and a year report with your supervisor as well to see if you need any further support to pass through your first year of, as a doctor. Generally, you need to have either BLS, ILS, or ALS in your first year of, medic, uh, of your foundation program. Um, this will be provided to you when you come to F1. And if you need to, if you need more information regarding this, you can ask your medical educator or supervisor about it, and they'll sign you up for the course. Um, I think it's free for all the F1s and F2s. Uh, they will use your study budget. For you can fail once, then you probably have to pay for the second second um, retake. Sorry. So also, you need to pass your PSA, which is the prescribing exam um, in your as a F1. It needs to be within two years. You also need to participate in audits and quality improvement. You need to be able to have taught some of the medical students or have given a pr presentation to your colleagues uh, to do the DCT. You also need to have what's called a TAP, a Team Assessment of Behavior, which essentially is a feedback from your colleagues to deem if you're a good doctor, if there's any behavioral problems, that, um, if, if there's any concerns about um, your profession, professional behavior. Um, and then your clinical supervisor will look through all those feedbacks and tell you things to improve. Um, also, you need to be uh, absent less than 20 days in order to pass your F1 and also have a minimum total of 60 hours of training, either core or non-core, and this will be uh, provided to you at the start of your foundation training. Um, it's very lengthy, so I'm not gonna go through that, but essentially uh, it's all e-learning, virtual simulations, and, and things like that, okay? So this is the example of my portfolio, which I've done, which I've done in my first year, so you can see that I've got my PSAs and COP procedures done, and I've logged in my, if I've got any publication or quality improvement projects, I'll log in into my portfolio, which the panel will then look through at the end of my year and see if I've met uh, quite the criteria to pass my first year. And once you've passed your first year as an F1, you will then be completion, which means that you will then move on into your second year of your foundation training, and also get the full GMC registration. As an F1, you only have um, a, a partly a part GMC registration or a, um, a not a full registration. So you need to pass your F1 in order to get the, the full GMC registration. Now a bit about the specialty training program. So the specialty training program is the, the training right after your foundation training. So here I've boxed, um, the training program, the special training program, there's two types. One of them is the run-through training program, and the other is a uncoupled training program, which I'll talk you through what's the difference in this slide. The run-through training program essentially is, there's only one round of recruitment. So once you finish your F2, you apply for the run-through training program into your ST1, and after that, you will then train up into your way to SD7 or 8 without any further um, competitive recruitment. What you have done is to provide competencies for every year to, to progress into your second and third up to your eighth year of training. Um, not every training has eight years. Some training is seven years, as, such as pediatrics, and so, um, some has three years, like GP. So if you want to know a bit more, just Google, Google on the net and find out uh, on their uh, specialty website. The uncoupled training pr program, um, there's two rounds of recruitment. So when you finish your F1 and F2, you'll then have to apply into either 
in internal medical training, to do medical um, specialties, or core surgical training if you want to do um, surgical specialties, or acute common care STEM or ACCS if you want to do either emergency medicine, um, in intensive care, or if you want to do um, anesthetic. So after you go through, go into that core training. Once you finish that core training, you have to apply again into either SC3 or SC4 to into your higher specialty training. So there's two rounds of recruitment process in the uncoupled um, specialty training program. So here I've listed some of the rancher specialties. I'm not sure if this is the full specialty, um, all the rancher specialties, because I can see here that I've not put in radiology, but this is essentially the examples of rancher specialties. To name a few, you've got cardio, cardiothoracics. Oh, I've got radiology here, uh, psychiatry. Now there are um, some surgical trainings that are run through, such as general surgery, and I believe vascular has their own run through. Some of the deaneries have their own run throughs, but if you want to find a bit more, find, a, find more information, then look there. On the right, there's competitive ratio as well. It differs from year to year. Uh, it depends on how many posts there are available in that particular year and how many applicants there are. Um, some can be really competitive, such as cardiothoracics, um, neurosurgery. Is, um, generally, surgical trainings are more competitive than medical training. So, so this is the list of uncoupled specialties that I've men uh, mentioned. Um, to name a few, gastroenterology, uh, emergency medicine, you have to go through ACCS in, in order to go, get into emergency medicine, um, real medicine, technology. So I think Dr. Kimberly Tan has mentioned a bit about the application scoring. I will just go through really quickly um, the criteria that she, she's mentioned, the domains that she's mentioned. So um, I'm applying for IMT this year, so I'm gonna go through a bit about IMT. So if you're applying for IMT um, and your portfolio scoring, there are a few domains that you need to get points on in order to be competitive, to get shortlist, shortlisted for interview. The first domain would be, if you've got any undergraduate degrees, any additional undergraduate degrees, depending on how well you do in your uh, degree. If you have any masters or any PhDs that you get points, uh, just be aware that MRCP doesn't count, uh, doesn't give you any points um, as it's not included in the criteria. If you have um, any merits or any awards as a student or during your F1 or F2, you will score points. If you've given presentations either nationally, internationally or regionally, um, you will score points. Publications, if you've say you've written a case report or if you've got any systemic reviews or um, original research publications you will score points but be aware that it has to be PubMed cited in order to score points. If you've given teaching um, or if you've organized a teaching program you will score points. If you've improvement project or audits you will score points as well and if you've got any posts in any um, societies or clubs any um, every events you will score points as well so it's important to score some points before you apply as that will put you in a better better position so that's the portfolio part of it you will once you've got, um, got an interview you will then go through a portfolio station and um, clinical reasoning station and it's called professional station communication communication station during your interview and some surgical uh, surgical applications have surgical skills um, stations as well. They will ask you a bit about suturing skills. Um, so if you want to know a bit more, look up on their college website and also just to be aware that um, the portfolio scoring is different from specialty to specialty. So make sure that you, you're looking at the, the right uh, specialty scoring. So now I'm just going to show you a bit about the timeline for recruitment. So generally, generally, the specialty um, application is published or advertised online at the end of the year, sometime in October or November. And the application is usually open two weeks after that. And it's about a month that you apply on the Oriole. You'll then have to 
um, put in all the you know, things, the marks that have for for all the domains I've mentioned in order to generate a portfolio scoring. And then that will then bring short, shortlist you for an interview if you're competitive enough. And that interview will be roughly around uh, early of, earlier of the, the next year, sometime in January or February. And then once you sit through that interview, you will then be told if you've managed to secure a job a month later, usually. So you'll be able to know if you've got a job very early on in um, your, the year before you you um, you get the job itself. You, you sorry, you work for the job itself. So I'm just going to talk to you about my experience. Um, so I graduated in new um, from 2019. Um, so my application process was a bit tough because I didn't get the jobs early on in the year like my um, counterparts did in the UK. I only got my job very late on in July because I was part of the RLMT, or essentially it means that I'm not a resident of the UK. I don't have a tier four visa or tier two visas. So I was put on the waiting list for a long time. But now um, the graduates from, the U from Malaysia, will not, from, sorry, from Newcastle will not have to go through this process because the RLMT has been abolished as mentioned by Dr. Kimberly Tan. So I got into the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital as, uh, as an F1. So I was working in general surgery for all three of my placements. This is because of COVID. So, um, they uh, need to miss my general medicine training because they retain all their juniors during the third placement. Hence, I've only been doing surgery since so things that went well for me is that i am really lucky to be in a tertiary center with um so Norfolk and Norwich university hospital has leading advances on robotic surgery so there's a lot of research and audit opportunities which i have done quite a few of them um, also things that went well for me is that there are mrcp teachings available in the, in the hospital um, I was able to publish um, some case reports um, and also scrub in for, for um, some surgeries. And also I learned to be really independent on the wards because on surgery, your trainees, your core trainees and your registrars are usually in tier tiers. So you're the first point of contact if there's anything wrong on the wards. So you tend to be more independent when dealing with things on the ward. Um, I've managed to um, secure my ALS as well. And I've taught some medical students during my first year. And also, I've managed to build my portfolio for my course training application. The thing is the networking. So I've managed to make quite a lot of friends and colleagues that are really nice and helpful. And also, um, I've managed to um, take part in research. There was a research team in, in my hospital, and I've managed to, to be part of it. And we are pub uh, pub publishing quite a few case reports and systemic reviews on hold at the moment because of COVID. So things that didn't, sorry, so things that didn't really go well for me is that it's very stressful um, during COVID. There are many rotor gaps because a lot of the doctors had to self-isolate because they had symptoms of COVID. So it was, I would say, really, really stressful <laughs> during that period of time um, because I was working on a COVID ward have died and it's really really um really sad to see but it is inevitable you will see patients that are dying in front of you anything that you've done anything that you try to do will not help the patient sometimes but that's essential as part of your career um i've missed out on my general medicine training as i've mentioned that was not good at all because i wanted to apply for medicine i'm not going to delve too much in the healthcare system because it's very long history is really long but essentially it is a government sponsored healthcare system and it's available for all permanent residents um, there are four components to it so there are nhs england scotland wales and northern ireland and one of the one of the aims of the nhs is to reduce inequalities as mentioned in the in the plan 2000 if you want to have a read through you can google on, uh, on the internet as well and and just a rough idea of 
uh, how much the UK spends on their healthcare. The UK spends about 10% of their GDP on healthcare. So that is more than Malaysia. Um, so the workplace culture, uh, essentially working, working one year in the UK, I find that people are mostly very helpful. So if, if you help them, they will help you back. If you are nice to them, they will be nice to you. Essentially, this is how everyone works. Everyone works, I think, regardless of where you work. And uh, I think teamwork is key when you work in the UK because people like people will come to you when they need help. Um, so it's best to help them out if you can. And it's best that uh, if you're stuck with something to, to find help as well. So um, just remember that everyone plays a very important role in the system everyone plays an important role and it's very important to respect that because if one fails everything will then fail as well um, another important thing is I, I found out is that everyone wants to leave on time so say if you're working a night shift and if the doctor from the day shift has a lot of things that they can't manage to do it's very nice and very important that you help them out uh, it's very nice to just say, look, just hand everything over to me and I'll try and sort everything out for you and you go home. So say if the next day you're, you're having a really busy night shift and you're, you have things to hand over in a day, say you have patients in A&E that you can't see because you're too busy, it's also very nice that you can hand over to the day doctor as well. So just, re just remember hand over. Um, a bit about racism. I've not um, experienced any racism during my first year as so a doctor. Um, racism is not tolerated in the hospital and anywhere in the UK. So say if you come to if you've experienced some racism, it's important to reach out to your supervisor and then try and rectify the issue. Okay. So a few things um, why you should consider coming to the UK. I think um, training in the UK is quite awesome. The work hours are not not long at all i believe i that's what i feel compared to if i train in malaysia it's much less working hours and the wages are quite decent there are also workplace guardians of safe working to pre prevent you from training from working too too much or more than what you're contracted to if you are if, if you are um, overwork then you can exception report to get some money back as well um, there is also ability to, to do some local work for extra money. Um, also, one thing I would like to mention is there is a out of premium, pro, sorry, out of program pause when you train in a higher specialty um, program. Say if you're ST4 and if you want to do some research or some teaching, you can do that. Um, there are also non training posts, say if from F2 to F, from F to to call training to other things you can you can apply for a clinical fellowship non-training posts or f3s um, also there are study leaves available um, if, if um, and funds available as well if you want to go for a course say if you want to go to edinburgh for a for a cardiology course you can do that if you speak to your education supervisor and they will able be able to help you help you um, achieve that also say if say the six placement that you have um there there's no placement that you'd like say if you like pediatrics and you weren't given the placement in your f1 or f2 you can apply to this taste week uh in pediatrics as well okay so these are the rota rules um that i've mentioned so um there are rules in place to prevent you from working too much so that's a really nice um thing if you're working in the uk because then you can you can say okay this is part of my contract i call too much and use those hours that you, you're not working to build your portfolio essentially so that's really nice that's why i find nice working in the uk also um now that there's um a new visa that's being rolled out this year it's called the health sorry health and care visa um Previously, when I applied to the UK, I had to apply for tier two um, working visa, which is much more expensive. I think it was 610 pounds for two years when I applied. And now the health care visa is only about 32 pounds, which is a lot cheaper. And also with this visa, um, you don't need to pay a healthcare surcharge. 
which was 400 pounds a year. So you save quite a lot of money um, when you apply this year, I believe. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. And um, are there any questions? Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation, Leo. So I think um, YC has been answering um, uh, many of the questions. And at the moment, I think we don't have any outstanding questions. Oh, thanks, YC. <laughs> Thank you very much for answering all the questions. Um, do we have any, any, any more questions? We still have four minutes left. How long do I work a day? Um, that depends. So my rota, there are normal working days where I work um, 8.30 to 5.30 and there are also on call shifts um, that I work for 12 and a half hours. So from 8 to 8.30. Um, next question, what's your drink? Uh, next question, what's the best way to apply for FY1? So if you're applying, um, the best way to apply for FY1 would be through the oral process, essentially. I think YC has mentioned that. That's the best way. Okay, um, next question. Can you post an example slide for core procedures regarding how we should compose our experience during the core procedure? Example, IV cannulation. Um, so, so essentially, is if you the competencies, you can get one of your seniors F two or registrar core training to look through what you're doing it, and they can sign you off on the Horus e portfolio. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? We still have three minutes left. Okay, I'm guessing no more. So I'll just wrap up the webinar for today. So a huge thank you to both our speakers, um, YC and Liu, who is here with us today, and also um, to Dr. Nicholas Tan and Kimberly Tan, who have dedicated their time to speak to all of us. So I hope all the participants have gained a better understanding in terms of um, being an IMG and also applying for the training program in the UK post-graduation. So um, next Sunday, the country that we will be covering is the US and it's also our final webinar for this CHIPS um, UK IMG webinar series. So do keep an eye out on our social media if you're interested in um, participating. And to all the participants, I'll email you the feedback form after this session. And I'll also drop the feedback form link down on the chat box below. So we highly appreciate if you could help us fill up the feedback form um, so that we can know what went well and also areas which could be improved. And filling up this webinar also gives you priority to sign up for our next talk. Um, we do have a few more questions. Are the speakers happy to address the questions? Uh, hi, Leo and YC. Um, as far as the taxation, um, it's it's very hard to to explain right here because um, if you email me, I'll probably be able to t tell you a bit more about the taxation. Um, well, I, I can, I can just very briefly about the taxation. So essentially, um, the UK system is a little bit complex, um, but you get a personal allowance um, every year. So last this year was um, 12,500. So the first 12,500 you earn doesn't get taxed. Um, and then from 12,500 all the way to 50,000, you get taxed 20% um, base rate tax. So 20% on, um, on whatever you earn and 12% national insurance. So national insurance is a little bit more complex. Um, and I have not gotten around to kind of sorting mine out as well. Um, I don't think anyone has unless you're an accountant. Um, mm. But essentially, you just think of it as 32% taxed um, from whatever you earn from 12,500 to 50,000. And anything you earn above 50,000 gets taxed 40% and 2% national insurance, so 42%. Um, and that goes up all the way to, I think, 145,000, which I don't think any one of us is going to be hitting anytime soon. At least I'm not going to be hitting that anytime soon. Um, but uh, taxation is a little bit more complicated than that. Um, 
so you know, I, I won't be able to answer specifically into that, unfortunately. But this is the, the gist of it. Essentially, is um, for the so twelve thousand five hundred tax free, twelve thousand five hundred to fifty thousand is roughly thirty two percent, and anything beyond that is forty two percent. That's that's the rough idea of it. Okay, thank you. So I guess that's the end of the webinar. Um, to the participants, we do hope that you could help fill up the feedback form. And that's the end of the webinar. You may leave now. Thank you. Um, can both the speakers um, just stay back for a little while for a quick debrief? Thank you.